I'm Katie, and I'm the Education Director here at Carolina Tiger Rescue. I'm Lauren, I am the Senior Keeper here at Carolina Tiger Rescue. And today we're going to answer questions that you guys may have and share some of our favorite memories. Uh, and those questions are going to be read by Jessica, our Communications Director. Um, don't worry, she is actually here, she's just behind the camera. All right, so to get this rolling until we get some questions coming in, we're going to talk about some of our favorite memories here at Carolina Tiger Rescue. Um, I think one of the kind of ongoing memories that I have that's definitely reoccurred more than once is we definitely have an awesome team here at Carolina Tiger Rescue. We have some wonderful animals that we take care of, but a lot of times we work late if we have an animal knockdown or we're here working outside in the cold or the rain and that's what's required of taking care of the animals. And we have an awesome house staff, so if we are working late, working outside in the cold weather or the elements, we have a lot of our staff members that are really awesome and call down to bring us food, to bring us snacks, to help refuel us so we can keep working to make sure that if we are doing an animal knockdown that we can keep going strong, or if we're here late that we don't have to stop to go out to do dinner. So I'm really, really proud and happy to have all my coworkers here. Um, they're so supportive and we really do have a, a great team effort together. So I think that's one of my favorite memories and it happens a lot. So uh, yeah, what about you, Katie? Oh goodness. No um, pressure, right? I think one of, I don't know, gosh, there's so many. I think actually my, my first time here at Carolina Tiger Rescue, I took a tour. Um, like many of you guys do and just being able to come out and see these animals that you see on TV or in pictures just up close and hearing um, uh, Raja and Kayla were the first tigers I ever saw in, in real life up, up close and they both chuffled and, and I fell in love and said all right I'm in um, and so then being able to continue that journey into a Volunteer and then a staff member has just been amazing, but I don't think I'll ever forget being able to see them uh, for the first time up close and, and hearing their their chuffles and their greetings and their of course their moans to tell us how hard their life is. All right, sounds like we have our first question. All right, our first question is how do the cats handle the winter weather? So a lot better than I do. Um, the cats in general do okay. The big cats are, their bigger bodies are definitely built for the colder weather. They can withstand colder temperatures than the smaller animals and cats can. So you guys may have seen one of our latest videos about how we prep for the winter. Um, these small cats all have heaters in their den boxes. And so we put straw for everybody. And then like I said, the small cats get heaters. Um, and if it's really snowy and icy out, you'll probably find the small animals in their den boxes uh, for most of the day. But during just the kind of cold North Carolina weather, everyone's out running around. Um, I actually think they prefer the cool weather over the hot water weather. Um, and even when it is snowy and icy out, you'll see a lot of the big cats out and about checking things out. Um, I've definitely seen them run up and hit the fence and then had a big pile of snow that was on top of the fence come down and hit their heads and they kind of shook it off and kept going. So. Um, overall, they do pretty well considering that North Carolina does not get to be that cold. Um, we only have it typically got to go down into the low 20s as a really cold day. We have another question. What do these cats eat? Well, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, cats are what we call obligate carnivores, uh, meaning they eat only meat. And so we feed them a variety. We typically feed them chicken. Um, but we also get deer during hunting season, and if someone has hit a deer, uh, they can bring that deer to us. Um, we also get grocery stores that if they have extra meat that has hit the sold, hit the sold by date, sell by date, uh, they can stick it in their freezers and we can come pick it up and we'll get ground meat, um, pork chops, uh, steaks, a whole bunch of different sort of meats. And we also get a big donation from the community. If people have a horse or a cow that is sick or is already going to be euthanized, they can bring those animals out here and then we can uh, euthanize them on site and then we do all our own butchering on site as well. Um, and that's a nice uh, kind of different treat for the cats. So they get a pretty wide variety of food. Um, yeah, which makes uh, life a little more interesting when you don't get the same thing every day. 
And they usually eat better than I do, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the quality of the meat's really good. <laughs> so. All right, what are, or who is your favorite animal, if you have one? Oh. That's go a with tough them. one. <laughs> Animals that are no longer with us. Right? Um, in my favorite animal um, is, or was, Kayla, tiger. Um, she uh, is one that I got to do operant conditioning with, um, and she was one that, um, if she heard my voice, she just would come running up to the fence, um, often because she knew that I had food for her, um, but it was just nice to see her come up. Um, as far as right now, it's it's tough. They all have their different personalities and all their likes and dislikes, so it's always difficult to say um, who the favorite is. I, I definitely love uh, India Tiger um, because uh, she's just got uh, quite the attitude with her. Um, and she uh, is sometimes confused and will make a moaning sound that sounds an awful like, like <laughs> a cow mooing, which is uh, very endearing as well. All right, so we have a question from Ted Vital. Who does the butchering? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Only when Katie's feeling spry. No, no. Uh, the keepers, we do. I do a lot of it. Kara and LA, as we also know as Larissa. Um, and then sometimes we've got a lot. Actually, oftentimes we have our animal care volunteers also help us out. So it's one of those skills that uh, you eventually learn um, if you do animal care with us. So. All right, let's talk about more memories. Um, oh boy, uh, I think probably one of my favorite memories is uh, just working with Vincent. He was one of our tigers that had passed away. Um, he came to us extremely aggressive, uh, very um, untrustworthy of people and his surroundings. And when I first arrived, he had been here for a couple months and you couldn't walk by his enclosure without him charging the fence, getting really upset. Uh, so I started working with him with operant conditioning and just over the course of even just a year, you saw significant changes in his behavior. Um, just giving him treats for calming down and then working on specific behaviors that would help us with animal care, with helping with vet care. Things like sitting down, going to his station, uh, targeting, um, holding still for voluntary injections it really changed his demeanor. We got to the point where he actually didn't mind visitors and never, he was on the, he was never on the tour route. Um, but just with that patience and that kind of consistent training, um, really did change his personality quite a bit. So I think that's probably one of my uh, favorite stories of, of Vincent Tiger. All right. We have a question. If a guest could only learn one thing while on a tour, what would you want them to learn? Oh, hmm. that's a good question. I think it's important for them to know where these animals come from and why they're with us. And so many of them come from <laughs> seemingly different backgrounds, but a lot of them are very similar in that they were exploited in some manner. Whether they were involved in the pet trade or at a roadside zoo or in some sort of entertainment business that, you know, once they're done with that or the owner can't take care of them anymore, um, they all need a home and they all need the best care. and. And it's really important to know what your choices are as far as the facilities that you can visit and how detrimental some of the places that they come from are. Um, and just knowing where you visit and, and how important it is the work that they do and just really look into uh, those places. Anything to add? No, I think that that's, <laughs> sums it up pretty well. Nicely said. Can you guys answer this? How are you different from a zoo? So, um, <clears throat> we're similar in some ways, but different in others. So, um, the role of the zoo often is to exhibit animals to the public. Um, and there can also be other aspects to a zoological facility as well. Sometimes they are for profit. Um, sometimes uh, there may be, let me back up. Um, so, then in comparison to a sanctuary, um, you do have to be a nonprofit and animals do stay at the sanctuary uh, for life. And now there is a definition for uh, the federally um, accredited nonprofit, which is you are not, wow, federally accredited sanctuary, if I can get my words right today, <laughs> oh boy, um, that you are a nonprofit, um, that you do not buy or sell any of your animals or their parts. Um, you do not allow the public to come into contact with those animals. Um, and there is no breeding allowed. 
Um, whereas at a zoological facility, um, sometimes you have a, um, a stable population, but oftentimes animals can be uh, traded or sold to other zoos, oftentimes sometimes for uh, species survival plans to maintain uh, good genetics, and so you do have animals going back and forth to different facilities. Um, oftentimes, like I said, the goal of a zoo is to exhibit those animals for the public. Um, oftentimes the goal of a sanctuary is, again, just to make sure that those animals come into a home for life, and that sanctuary may or may not be open to the public. Um, a lot of times the animal care side of things are very similar of there's enrichment, there's training, there's really good care of the animals, um, but oftentimes it's more on, on the uh, standard definition of that difference. Did I miss anything? You want to add anything to that? I, I think one of the other things that we definitely explain to people when they come is that, um, and Lauren kind of touched on it, but you're not going to see everybody here and our animals always have a choice whether or not they want to come up. Their enclosures are large enough, there's spaces where they can go to the back. We do, because we house animals who don't do well with the public, like Lauren mentioned, Vincent, that um, they're off tour. They don't have to see people. We always make sure that there's at least two days a week where they don't see large groups of people so that they get excited when people come up. Um, and, and that is a freedom that we have as a sanctuary that zoos don't have, whether good or bad. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's exciting when the tiger Raja will come up to the fence because he hasn't seen a large group of people in a day or so. Um, and it gives you a good look at, as to how big they actually are and they care that you're there. Mm -hmm. And even to add on to that, you know, there are good sanctuaries and not good sanctuaries, and the term sanctuary is not copyrighted, and so you have to be really careful when you're visiting a sanctuary or a zoo, and do your homework before you visit any facility uh, to make sure you're spending your money and you're supporting a good facility, because they're good and bad at both places. Um, we got Beverly Clapp says she remembers Vincent and going out for a keeper for a day tour <laughs> with Lauren. So let's talk yeah. about some more memories. Do you have any memories of guest on tour or any uh, special tours that you guys did that you want to share? Um, I, this is a, it, not quite a tour, although there was a tour out one day last, I think it was last year, um, a news uh, crew came out and wanted to see some enrichment uh, with Christmas trees with some of our cats. Um, and we had decided to give it to some Christmas trees to the lions. Um, Sheba and Sebastian. Sheba and Sebastian <laughs> and, and Tarzan. And Tarzan at the time. And, mm -hmm. um, and one thing you learn very quickly in working with any animals is they do what they want. Um, that is especially the case with cats and they certainly don't make your life easy. So we got the news camera set up, we got the trees ready, we uh, un unshifted the cats, the lions came in, they sniffed the trees and they plopped down to take a nap, um, which was not great TV. And so <laughs> luckily um, we uh, changed tactics very quickly. We then um, dragged some trees over to Raja and Kayla while they were still living together and uh, they did amazing. We're super excited about their trees. but. Um, it just goes to show you cats of all sizes and ages and species uh, do what they can to make your life as difficult as possible, um, especially if there is a, is a camera on them. Oh yeah, can't make them do what they don't want to do. No. Absolutely not. Uh, um, so a lot of people saw our post about Capriccio yesterday. How is he doing today? He is still uh, snoozing. Um, not uncommon, so a lot of times after a knockdown, it is very tiresome and they are still recovering. And so he spent the rest of the evening kind of snoozing. We checked on him throughout the day and he would open an eye when we came up and kind of pick his head up and he flip-flopped over in the sun and, and took a sun bath for the rest of the day. And then uh, we did give him access to his den box overnight, so he moved himself into the den box overnight. And this morning he's still snoozing away, he checked on him, he's moving around a little bit. Um, probably by the end of the day, he'll start perking up, um, get some food into him, but definitely not uncommon um, to see them kind of try to sleep it off a little bit. It's kind of like having a hangover. You're tired, you want to get rehydrated, get some food into you, and then you'll start feeling all right. But the knockdown went really well. Um, another question, are there any of these cats from the wild? No, they were all born in captivity. Um, some of our small cats were actually born here as part of our former uh, breeding program. I think we have five, six, maybe seven left from that. Otherwise, um, they were all born in captivity, either roadside zoos, 
um, like the ones we rescued from Colorado, or private ownership, Elvis Serval was privately owned, Toby Serval was privately owned, and Zoe Serval, um, which if you see a trend there, unfortunately Servals are big in the pet trade. Um, but all of our cats were born in captivity, um, which makes it impossible then to put them out in the wild, so they will stay in captivity for the rest of their life. Can, um, can I bring my kids out to uh, see the animals? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, we take education very seriously here, and what we believe, too, is that um, the, the ones that are going to help these guys the most are the next generation and understanding that they are wild and dangerous animals and need to be treated that way. We have several opportunities. We have our normal public tours on the weekends, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Um, for those uh, who have younger kids, um, starting back up in the spring, we have our Tiger Tales Tour which is on one Wednesday morning a month and um, geared towards the ages of two to seven and their accompanying adult, of course. We read a book about a tiger who used to live in uh, a city and realizes that's not the best place for him. And then we do a craft and we do an abbreviated tour um, to, to match up with their attention spans. And then my best and favorite time of year is summer camp. We offer uh, summer camp uh, in the summer for rising third through fifth graders, and then we do a week uh, for rising sixth through eighth graders. So if you have a kid who's really interested in it, um, it's a great way to come out, meet these animals. Um, uh, they, the tigers get to paint for them, um, and we build enrichment for them, and it's just an awesome way to spend your week. Mm -hmm. You guys, uh, Charlie Rhodes wants to know who are the tigers behind you, um, and what are their stories? That's a great question. Let's see. <laughs> All right, we've got Mona on one side. Aria, the other. <laughs> this is Mona, and Mona came from a roadside zoo in Missouri with her sister Moki um, and two other tigers, Finnamore and Emerson, who live in a different enclosure. And their roadside zoo that they were at was closed down after a volunteer was hurt by another tiger. Um, the the interesting and funny, and when I say funny, sad, I mean sad part of this is. When that volunteer was taken to the hospital, he was told to lie to save the, the rep reputation of this roadside zoo. Um, and the doctor asked him what happened, and he said he got bit by a dog. Um, dogs are much smaller than tigers, and it didn't take the doctor long to realize that that probably was an inaccurate statement. Um, and so he fessed up, said he was bit by a tiger, and that roadside zoo was closed down as it, as it should be. So. Um, we went out and we rescued Mona and Moki and Finnamore and Emerson from Missouri. And Aria is behind me, so we actually see her uh, picture upon arrival here in our quarantine facility um, and her after picture once she's been here for over a year. Um, Aria was a former pet and uh, as good of intentions as the owners had for her, um, Aria was slowly starving to death and they had attempted many times to find a vet to look at her because they knew something was wrong. But as a lot of times, when you have a tiger, it's not the same thing as taking your domestic cat to the vet. And they could not find a veterinarian to come take a look at her and help her. And so as she was slowly wasting away, uh, the neighbors actually called animal control uh, on them. And they came out to look at her and saw the conditions that she was in. Um, she eventually ended up here. And once we were able to get a physical on her, get her down, get blood work on her, um, we found out that she had EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency which means your pancreas is not functioning the way it should and it's not secreting enzymes to help you break down your food, which then allows you to gain weight when you eat. Um, she also had a salmonella infection, which could have been secondary to the EPI. Um, so once we got her treated and back on her feet, you can see when she came in, she was skin and bones, literally. She was in really rough shape. Um, but we actually uh, treat EPI by feeding beef pancreas and that uh, mimics the action of your pancreas actually working in your body. And with some time, um, lots of medication, and beef pancreas were able to actually um, get her back to a healthy condition. And you can see just that before and after of how much more vibrant her coat is. You can see the life back in her eyes um, now that she, again, was being treated uh, and getting a healthy diet. And again, just a lot of people don't realize what goes into taking care of these big cats and they're not pets they're not easy to to maintain and own and that's one of the consequences of when they get sick what are you going to do and so she was lucky that she found us because she may not have made it another week
As you guys, Kathy Ryan wants to know, how many cats did you take from the Colorado Rescue last year? We took 16 animals. Uh, 14 of them were cats. Um, so I feel like you're trying to trip me up there. Mm -hmm. um, we took eight tigers, a leopard, two serval, nope, I'm sorry, two caracals, a serval, mm -hmm. Uh, two coatamundis, which are an animal from Central and South America. They're actually related to the raccoon and the kinkajou. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, two bobcats. So and, leopard. Right? and a leopard. And a leopard. I always forget Anthony. I'm Poor so Anthony. sorry. <laughs> Poor Anthony. And a leopard. Um, so we rescued 16 animals total. 14 were cats. Mm -hmm. um, Amy Crowder wants to know, what do you guys think of the Genome Project to bring back extinct tiger subspecies? All right, Lauren, I'm passing that one to you. <laughs> oh boy, I'm even going to admit that I have a brush up because I'm not 100% familiar with all the workings and doings of that. So, um, yeah, I'm going to pass up Amy that we can discuss that later because I don't have a solid answer for you. We'll, we'll get back to you. Yeah, we will. Amy, we know where you live. We'll, we'll discuss. All right, so it looks like we're going to be talking about some more memories as we wait for some more questions to roll in. Do you have any more favorite memories, Katie? The first time you met me or something like that? Oh, it was definitely unforgettable. Uh-huh, I'm sure it was. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. I think that as, as I mentioned summer camp earlier, and I think as difficult as it is to do four weeks of camp um, just with the the full days and having all the kids here it is um it's it's a lot of fun and being able to see kids come back i've got a, a camper coming back for her fourth year um and just to be able to see how excited she gets every year and how um how much fun she has and it just is a lot of a lot of hope that these guys uh as far as ours here but also the ones in the wild may have a chance um for survival because there's there's interest out there in saving them um, and and I love being able to teach them and show them and give them that healthy respect of of how wild and dangerous these guys are but also how much they do need their the our help. Mm -hmm. um, Sylvia wants to know how do the cats from tropical climates do in the winter? I mean in the colder climates. They actually do pretty well and so uh, we like I talked about before we did the winterizing video. And so that was actually talking about the cats, but it's a very similar process for um, tropical animals, so the king Jews and the Um So uh, I think we may have done a short video on coatis about how we prep their food, but they have uh, basically a house. <laughs> we bought a storage shed that we winterized. We built some platforms and some ramps in there. We have heat lamps in there, um, actual heater pads in there. Um, we insulated the roof, put a tarp over it to keep it waterproof, and so they pretty much stay in there all winter long. Um, it's enough space for us to go in there, put food in, change blankets out, um, so it's their home, home, own little winter world in there. Um, and that is actually out in their enclosure. The kinkajous we actually do bring inside uh, into the vet center into indoor enclosures over the winter time. Um, we have not been able to winterize their outdoor habitats, and so what we've done is built enclosures inside. And it has all the same stuff that they have outside, fire hose and platforms and a den box. But what we're able to do downstairs is provide heaters uh, as well as humidifiers uh, to keep them nice and, and warm. And then that way uh, their skin doesn't dry out with the humidifiers to help that. So that's what you see on the wish list, the humidifiers and the filters for that. So they're pretty toasty and they'll go back outside when the weather warms up to be a minimum of 50 degrees at night. So that's typically we're looking at around May. When they go back outside, they typically come in in October in the winter time. They got to stay out a little longer this year. Yeah, when it's a little warmer, warmer. longer, and they've got a couple more weeks out. So um, depends on the year, how we're looking temperature wise. All right, you guys. Mary Ann wants to know or says your staff is so amazing and caring <laughs> and compassionate. Um, how do you deal with your attachment to the animals upon their passing? Uh, not well sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, I think for me, every every death is hard. Um, we do try to remember that when an animal passes away, it does allow for um, a space to open up for a new rescue, and so that is always very encouraging to know, okay, um, you know, when Aria passed last November, it was difficult, um, but then uh, we knew that new cats were coming from Colorado, and so um, our attention was 
quickly uh, moving to them, even though it was really difficult. Um, I would say September uh, was the hardest for me in losing Kayla. Even though we knew she was sick for a while, it was very difficult. And it's one of those things that um, it takes a little bit to get over. It's, it's, it took me a little bit to go back out to where she used to live because I knew that she wasn't going to come up to the fence to me anymore. Um, but there are always, you know, there's 48 other animals who knew who need homes or, or need that attention and need um, our support. This is where they live and will always live. So luckily there's, there's plenty of others out there with lots of personality that uh, quickly take your attention. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, knowing that we've always done the best that we can for them and we're not going to draw out a process if it's time for them to go because we don't want them to suffer. It's all about quality of life. And so if we reach that end of quality of life, it's then the, the humane decision to go ahead and, and euthanize that animal. And so knowing that we kept them as happy and healthy as long as we could, um, that, that, that is comforting, even absolutely. though it's always hard to say goodbye. I guess, absolutely. You guys, Shirley Horton wants you to talk about the adoptive parents or being an adoptive parent. Oh, we mm -hmm. have um, an amazing group of adoptive parents, and Shirley knows that. <laughs> um, one of our stellar adoptive parents. One of our stellar Absolutely. adoptive parents. And what, um, uh, so the adoption uh, program is that uh, uh, you give a monthly donation. Um, in honor of uh, a, an animal of your choosing and um, it's based on the size of the animal so the larger animals are um, one cost I think it's a hundred dollars a month um, and then the, down to the smaller ones the kinkajous which is 50 a month um, and so um, with that uh, come amazing um, privileges in that you we teach you to come out and uh, you go through training and we teach you how to visit your animal and how um, you also can bring out your guests to teach them about your animal. Um, we have some pretty incredible adoptive parents who build super elaborate enrichment for them. Um, Anthony got a school bus, Anthony Lepper got a school bus um, this uh, at the beginning of the school year. Um, Madonna has gotten a sand castle out of boxes and Yes, this is all enrichment, not an actual school bus. Right. An a, a enrichment item made of boxes to be painted like yeah, these things. Yeah. So they knew what I meant. Mm -hmm. Just just clarify. Um, <laughs> but it is it is something that, that helps in, in your donation helps in the care of those animals. Um, and it's definitely something that we couldn't do without you. And you're just, as adoptive parents, you're an extended part of our family. Um, and ones that we love and appreciate. And I... I don't think we have enough good things to say about yeah. how amazing they are. Well, that's a great way to get to know animals. Always, always say in a safe manner. You know, people get really excited about getting to know these cats on an individual level, but we also talk about how it's very inappropriate and unsafe to get these animals as pets. And so, this is a safe way to come and get to know the different personalities of our animals um, and and help us take care of them in a responsible way. And so, it's a great way to kind of uh, get to know uh, a lot of the animals and they they know who brings the fun stuff yeah absolutely. they figure out they figure you out real quick <laughs> is it legal to have a tiger as a pet where <laughs> <laughs> here in north carolina or <laughs> um we'll soon yeah right so uh north carolina is one of four states left uh, where there are no state laws against owning a non-native species so in other words in North Carolina, you cannot own a box turtle um, or a squirrel. You have to get a rehabber's license to uh, hang on to those guys or to rehab those guys. But there are no state laws against owning a tiger. Um, and the scary part of that is, aside from just the fact that anybody can own a tiger, is that we don't know how many there are in North Carolina. Uh, there are county laws and there are city laws um, against it. However, uh, there are no state laws against it. Um, so it is, it is something to think about as we have, we get into winter and we'll have the occasional ice or snowstorm, um, or we have hurricanes and tornadoes that we have means here and ways here to keep our animals safe and, and where they belong. Um, but that's not to say that your neighbor does um, because there's no regulations on that. And we don't know where they are. Um, and, and most recent, or not most recently, but uh, Wake County did not enact their laws against, um, against owning uh, exotic cats until about 15 years ago. 
when um, a man's three-year-old son was mauled by his pet tiger um, and left permanently blind and with some brain damage. Um, the, the boy uh, luckily lived, however, he is living with the permanent scars of that. Um, so unfortunately, it usually takes something bad to happen for um, laws to be enacted, but we hope through our education here um, to help, because most people don't know that or understand that, and we hope with our education here that we can help change those laws real quick. Yeah, stay tuned if uh, we're talking about potentially in the future working more with uh, legislatures to try to potentially uh, change those laws. So stay tuned uh, to our Facebook and, and everything for more information on potentially how to help. Um, Don wants to know who or what is the hardest animal to care for? Oh boy, <laughs> individual or species? <laughs> Probably depends um, on the day, right? <laughs> so let's assume we're talking about species. Um, the quaddies. The quaddies, definitely. They have been a challenge. Um, they are a new species to us. So uh, it was a little bit of a learning curve figuring out if uh, our very picky coatis were picky as a species or picky as individuals. And so we did reach out to other facilities that had them to try to figure out uh, what their coatis liked. Um, and so uh, as we talked about in one of the previous videos, uh, we just give them a whole bunch of options for food. They get a nice buffet of a tray of lots of different things. And then they may eat some of that one day, and then they may not eat that same thing the next day. And so trying to find something that they consistently like to eat is, is definitely challenging. Um, but they've been really fun too. It's always fun to, to work with a new species and learn their, their quirks and, and their characteristics and their personalities. Um, but they're definitely a riot, and if uh, you come for a, a visit, they are off tour. Um, you may be able to see them off tour if, if you have a friend with you. But um, yeah, they, they spend most of their time in the winter in their little house, so you, they might poke their heads out once it's uh, spring again. And they they love when we give them a different scent enrichment. They'll yes. actually rub it in their tails, mm -hmm. which is a new thing that we've never seen yes. with our animals before. Yes. But they'll smell it, and then they'll rub it in their tail, and they just mm -hmm. get it nice and stinky. Yep, yep. Which is always fun to watch. <laughs> Hence the axe and the obsession and all those perfumes we ask. The quaddies especially like those smells. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, Harper wants to know how many cats we have and how many we can carry. So we currently have 48 animals, uh, 17 are tigers. Um, we actually have most, uh, the most tigers of any other species. Um, four, I'm sorry, five of those animals are not cats. Those are three uh, kinkajous and two coatis. Um, and, and as far as capacity, that's always a hard question to answer. Um, because uh, it all depends on how they come in. So right now we have um, two uh, big cat enclosures open. One of them um, could house one tiger and another one could house uh, two, maybe three. Um, but if we get two single tigers that have to live by themselves, they would take up those two enclosures, which makes it um, then, you know, where we could have taken maybe four, now we have to take two. And as far as small cats, we do have small cat enclosures open, but it's kind of a, it's a difficult question to answer. We do have room to expand, um, and that's something that we uh, are looking into to hopefully put some other enclosures up. Um, but it's everybody, when people ask that, I always hate that I can't give them a, a number answer, but there isn't. There really isn't a number answer. We always look into also what is that animal need. Um, you know, you look at one like Aria who needs extensive medical care. Um, that down the road could mean that we have to, um, if we get a call for an animal, we may have to help find another home for them because we're committed to these guys as long, as for their entire lives. So if somebody comes in with some extensive medical needs, that may again mean down the road that we don't take another animal because we're committed to the ones that we have. Mm -hmm. And since we're a rescue organization, we don't get to choose the species or who's in need. And so we have to be flexible, whereas 15 years ago, the majority of our animals were small animals. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing a change that the more popular pets, the more animals in need right now are the medium to larger size animals. And so we have to change our sanctuary. We have to tear down small animal enclosures that we just aren't filling the enclosures and then building bigger uh, cat habitats uh, as that need changes. And so as a rescue, you do have to be somewhat flexible in order to meet the need of the animals in, in need. Don wants to know, are there any plans to bring in different species? 
So not at the moment. Um, a rescue, sometimes we can have a couple weeks of preparation, sometimes a month, and then sometimes it literally is, we get a phone call and we're hitting the road the next day. And so there's not always a lot of heads up or preparation, and it really just depends um, on the situation. Um, something tragic could certainly happen overnight, and that changes the, the game pretty quickly. Sometimes you do have time to plan and go out and check out the facility. Um, so at the moment, no. Um, but again, that can change always in, in a heartbeat and within a day or two. And there are species that we would not bring here. Um, we will not have uh, snow leopards um, or um, I think you'd heard, you know, the Canadian lynx would be hard to house here too because they require um, such different needs. Um, if we got snow leopards, we would be talking about large um, air, conditioned. air conditioned or <laughs> fridge type buildings because they need those cold environments mm -hmm. in this hot environment, especially in the summer, it's just too harsh for them. So, um, you know, we it was a new one with the quaddies and, and we're learning about them still um, and how that goes. Um, but it's, but we do know some species that we would just not be able to take. Bears, we're not going to take bears mm -hmm. um, because they're hard <laughs> and they're very strong and smart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are, we do know species that we would absolutely say no to. Um, but that means that we would help find them a different home. It's never a, nope, sorry, end of call. It's a, we wouldn't take, we can't take them, but let's find a place that can. You guys, let's wrap with one more memory. Maybe your first one or your first introduction to Carolina Tiger Rescue. That was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I already said mine. It was on a tour. I met Collins, Bobcat who uh, was where Elvis lives now, and he liked to spray around his water dish, and so we had to back up, because um, he could get some good range on that spray. <laughs> um, but it was it was the day before Thanksgiving, and it was really cold and rainy, but it was, you know, it was just so much fun that I didn't care, and I just had to come back. But mine was definitely not as long as it was long, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh geez, it, it's been almost 10 years. Um, I definitely remember Mr. our binturongs. We used to have over 15 binturongs when I first started working and they were such a cool species. Um, so getting to know those animals, I had never met a binturong before I started working here and they were incredibly unique and very cool. Um, so smelly. Yeah, and smelling, <laughs> yep, smelled like popcorn and Fritos. Um, so, uh, yeah, very, very distinctive smell, but they were really awesome animals and that was a lot of fun working with them. They have just passed away due to old age, um, over the years, uh, since we do not breed anymore. But, um, yeah, I think that, that, that was pretty fun. That was an awesome new experience. Mm -hmm. So, all right, guys. Well, I think we're hitting our time limit here. Thanks for tuning in and uh, sending some questions, and uh, we're happy to answer them. And uh, yeah, thank you. Fun. Have yeah. a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Bye, guys. Bye.